All right, giving it just a minute or two longer. And if you can scroll up a bit, I already put some topics in. Oh, uh, yes. Sure, thanks. All right. Um, and Alvaro, do you know if we have, uh, like where we are in the issue scrubbing, uh, is there a particular one we should start on when we get to that point in the meeting? And if so, if you could add that, that would be great. Yeah. So there's no new issues on the, uh, CDI repo. So maybe we could take a look at the HPP ones. We have three of them, uh, three there. Okay. Yeah, why don't you just go ahead and pop the link uh, into the agenda for everyone so they can follow along too. And with that, we can also um, get started on the agenda topics. So uh, welcome everyone to the May 8th SIG storage meeting. Uh, the first item that we have is uh, VM export topics. Um, and who would like to take this one? So I put it in as a result of some conversations we had last week. Um, okay, so basically today's uh, main Vert CTL already has support for exporting the entire VM YAML manifest. And we kind of considered backporting this uh, well, feature to 59, to the 59 release. And I think I think we raised that it's not a not a really big change and it might just make sense to pop it in. It's a great usability addition. But if we think it's too much of a, a feature backport, then we can go the other way, which is just documenting the curl and uh, certificate files uh, procedure. And um, just we should just discuss if if it's a viable backport, if it's something that can be done. Mm -hmm. From, to me, it makes sense because it's uh, first of all, it's a vert CTL change. So it's already not very breaking in nature. And also I hear it's just uh, from the conversation, it's really no big, big change. It's just some curl cert handling. Okay. Um, anyone else have opinions on this? I could open, oh, I guess we don't have the PR. This is the doc PR. I mean, the, from an upstream perspective, I don't think it matters at all. I think we'll just have to make sure that we, if it gets released in some open ships thing, then we'll have to get tested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I similarly feel uh, upstream wise, if there's a desire to have it backported and we don't think it would destabilize anything, then it seems like it could be okay. Um, yeah, so I guess barring no immediate concerns here, I would think it would be okay to prepare that PR and hopefully it's a simple cherry pick. I guess that also, it's usually the complexity of the backport and yeah, the, the effect of the change that we consider. So hopefully it's simple. It, it should be relatively straightforward. All right. And there's also a second topic that's, uh, if you recall when we were uh, discussing demoing the export on vanilla Kubernetes, uh, we understood that it's not so simple to set up the ingress. So um, maybe it could be like, a, maybe we could make like an issue out of this, some fun research uh, for somebody, a good first issue maybe. I really mm -hmm. don't know how how uh, complex it would be to set up uh, like a real ingress, but uh, yeah, this also came up last week. 
just might be a good fun time somebody mm -hmm. yeah i think it makes sense to have uh have an issue um do we have and i guess uh this is the doc pr does uh does this doc pr have i guess it does it lacks kubernetes uh instructions yeah the doc pr is just about the first topic which is the manifest export okay I just aggregated some VM export topics under this. Yeah, sure. Item. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah, so I, yeah, it's... I wrote the the document, the upstream uh, document PR, and I'm essentially ignoring the issue of you know how do we uh, get to these external links. I'm assuming that we have either a route or an ingress or something um, where it would generate the external links. And the document shows how you do things if that is the case. Mm -hmm. It doesn't explain how to set it up. But okay. That's one yeah. of those exercise left to the reader type deals in my opinion. Sure, sure. So it sounds like this makes this would be a good issue. Um Alex, could I add you uh yeah, as a of course. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. So anything else on the VM export topics? Um, regarding the first one, um, what, what should we do? Should we open an issue about this, about the backport? I would just open the backport PR. Um, okay. And we can just like if there's any uh, strong concerns uh, on that, it could be discussed there uh, whether to do it. So let's you know maybe keep it open for a little while longer uh, to invite comments uh, than we otherwise would. You know, assuming it passes the I right away. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. So let's move on to the next one, which is also by you Alex which is the upstream flakes uh yep we could actually defer it to the end of the meeting if you prefer so we so we get to uh Michael's topic persistent container disk okay yeah um, I'm happy to jump around uh if you'd like so let's take that one since it did get deferred yeah so Michael Um, yeah, a couple of meetings ago, uh, we talked about um, the desire from the community and to have some way to have like copy on write um, VM disks. And it turns out, um, you know, one thing that I mentioned kind of in passing was what about a persistent container disk where, uh, you know, the base image is, uh, you know, in the container storage of the node and the uh, copy and write layer is on a PVC somewhere. Turns out um, that David uh, looked into that a while ago and created a PR and it just kind of um, just closed without much interest. So um, <clears throat> I think it may be interesting to talk about you know, if we should, you know, should we resurrect this? Um, what are the, what's the real use case and what are the advantages and disadvantages? Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, that that's, I guess, what I'm wondering from the community. I think, um, You know, I think the main advantage is that if this base image is on the node, uh, the VM can start up really quickly, you know, the first time. There's yeah. no, um, no population phase. Uh, and um, if you're, you know, not writing a lot of data, it, it won't take a lot of space in the PVC. But I think, 
the advantages maybe go away, you know, if this is a VM that is going to be around for a while um, and it's going to have a lot of activity, um, you know, started and restarted a bunch of times. It, I think that's where um, the advantages aren't as clear to me, at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, we, I guess I got confused for a second um, about this just because I was thinking of how CDI imports container disks. So we already kind of have that workflow, although it's, as you mentioned, uh, this in some examples could be faster. Although if you did, if you use the node, um, the node pulse uh, strategy on the con persistent container disk, you might get a similar result. Right, because you're you've got the cached uh, container, or you have the yeah you have the cached image on the nodes already. Then in that case, yeah, but you're still copying, you know, um, some data. You know, if it's a big image, it could take a while. I would point out another downside is that when using uh, this approach, we are introducing a QCOW two layer um, into the flow. Right, so the PVC that you supply to go along with it, uh, in this case, would have a QCOW2 file where the backing image references the wherever the container disk uh, image appears. So this is a, I mean, I guess it should work as far as I know, but it's a pretty large step for us to be uh, adding QCOW2 layers into like the primary API. Well, I mean, don't we technically have it for like that weird host disk thing? Um, there's, I forget. Yeah, I'm trying to. But, it, but it's kind of the opposite. I think I think the way the host disk works is the, the base image is on a PVC and then the, the QCAL layer is on the node. I think there's like a shared base that way. Yeah, I don't, the host disk thing, I've been trying to... Um, I guess on a good day, ignore that it exists and on a bad day, actively trying to kill it. Um, I think it was a, I don't know who uses it. I'd be curious if anyone is um, actually using that. I think it's not a super great idea. Yeah, well, nevertheless, um, it, it was interesting to me that uh, this was something it, I guess it escaped my radar um, when it um, this PR came up and it seems that maybe based on the lack of interest in this PR, it's not something we really need to explore, but mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, wanted to bring it up to the community to see if they had opinions. Yeah, thanks for raising it. Any comments from anyone uh, about this idea? Any interest? Yes. Can you explain what is the storage behind the scenes? Later on, uh, we move away from Seth uh, with Brook to use Lean Store instead because there is no deduplication and copy on write without the um, duplication is very bad. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm a little, is this about, is this the next topic or is, I guess I'm just trying to understand it. The, 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 the solution that you was showing, copy on write, uh, what uh, kind of storage you use behind for you understand. So, the, you, so this you uses- with, with Seth for, for making happen or what is using to do this copy on write? So this is using um, QMU and the QCOW2 layer in this is what this copy and write refers to. So um, <clears throat> I didn't review this PR, but from just my understanding of, uh, of what they're trying to do here is you would have uh, your container disk, uh, which gets pulled down uh, and then the, the disk image file uh, that's inside of that container disk appears within the vert launcher uh, for the VM to access. And then the persistent volume claim that you supply in this example API would contain another uh, QCOW2 file that references uh, the relative path to where that um, 
container disk image appears, then what happens is QMU is able to uh, to use that image chain. So when the VM is running and it writes to the uh, persistent data, the writes would appear in a QCOW2 file on this PVC, uh, my PVC in this case, uh, but reads uh, would come all the way through the base image uh, if they don't exist in this uh, PVC. So this is just standard uh, QMU image layering uh, that's being implemented uh, within the Kubevert API. Yes, because these use a lot of storage and we are using the other one uh, lean store because mm -hmm. we do the same, but uh, we we have uh, the duplication to don't if we have several <laughs> copies uh, we don't have several mm -hmm. uh, the usage of, of the storage is, is is small. Why I'm putting these here? Uh, there I, I was part of the first meeting we have here uh, on on Mondays, mm -hmm. and until now I didn't have any information about. Seth, the duplications going out of alpha stage, going on bet or something. Is there any information that I can find? Um, Alexander, I think you, I can't remember, was it you that uh, looked into this? Um, I, From what I recall, there was no immediate plans to uh, to move this out of alpha, but I feel, I feel like one of you guys took a deeper look into that. Um, I asked Niels about it, but and he had no information. Um, but I don't know. Uh, we can definitely he he did not know, and I haven't heard anything since. But we mm -hmm. can check into it again. Um, yeah, I mean, if, I think. I, I think yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the one thing is just that now with we still have access to these people, but, um, you know, with, with the set being IBM now, um, I don't think we maybe have the visibility that we did before. Yeah. And I think there, I think there are, you know, channels that this feature request can be, you know, communicated, uh, you know, in the community, uh, to the, to the Ceph folks, um, you know, asking about that, uh, you know, taking a look. I'm not sure if there's uh, open issues or where those, you know, community things are, but I, I do think that it could be worked from the community angle. Um, and if they see, uh, you know, a, a large interest in that, um, there's a possibility to get some traction there. Yeah, that's why I would like to revisit that. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my, I mean, my definite recommendation would be to, uh, would be to go, you know, and interact in the Ceph community about that. Um, it's, you know, that's exactly, I think that's just the way that, uh, the way that this stuff would work, you know, unless, uh, you know, this, I guess, this being the, uh, the SIG storage community meeting, that would be the channel that I would recommend uh, in this forum. Uh, you know, if you're a Red Hat customer, you can do that stuff, but this would be about the, the community. So I would suggest uh, going there. Uh, we could, I mean, if Michael knows, I'm not exactly sure which uh, which repo or exactly where we, we found that information, but. If you can point me to the right direction, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's add an action item there. Uh, So I had a question about this. So this, uh, like somebody mentioned about this deduplication thing and it's still back, uh, sorry, backend store is providing that. So what I'm trying to say, QCOW2 and the deduplication, they will not be mutually exclusive, right? Like uh, the QMU can implement the QCOW2 layer and then ultimately all these, uh, the storage could do the deduplication, block level deduplication and ultimately just merge all the blocks having the same checksums. And they both can coexist together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, right. Yes, that's that would be my understanding as well. Um, it's uh, yeah, 
two completely separate layers uh, in the stack. Exactly. Uh, and the second thing, like I've asked this question, I never understood it. So like, uh, if like I'll ask again, uh, the, just to understand better. So, uh, so is it common, like at least in the container world, we used to have common that shared uh, the same base image is shared across multiple containers. Does the same thing happen in the keyword world? Yeah, so I mean, the, the pattern that's implemented today is, uh, by a lot of people is typically that you would have uh, a golden image, uh, a prepared, you know, VM disk image. And um, yeah, that same image would be uh, either cloned using the storage uh, to multiple VM instances, or, um, you know, if you're using uh, container disk imports, it could just be imported multiple times. But yeah, so yeah, that's what I was asking. So like, uh, because I don't understand, so pardon me for like very basic question. So if, if I have this golden image and if I start two VMs, how, how this image is shared between two VMs? Is there any notion of sharing? Or there is, is this not. a separate copy? No, it's, it's uh, we're creating essentially a clone. Um, it's, you know, it depends on how you create those two. Um, if you mm -hmm. use a CSI clone or if you're just importing it twice, um, but we sort of leave uh, you know, efficiency of managing duplicated data to the storage layer. So we don't really consider, for example, trying to have a shared uh, base image. Although I think um, at Kubevert Summit, I believe it was um, NVIDIA was showing a strategy that they had um, right. to take advantage of that more. So yeah. it's certainly and, possible and I, to do. Yeah, I think, and that's where I think uh, this proposal of QCOW to layer will allow you to do the sharing and uh, uh, sharing that base image, right? And uh, and save the base case. So the, you mentioned the leave it to the storage. The storage will only save you uh, the actual storage, the blocks on the storage, but not the base cache, the memory part of it, which I keep pointing to. Mm -hmm. So so like uh, there are two parts to it, right? That's saving the memory on the node and the base cache, and then, then saving the blocks on the disk. So if the storage supports, so supports the deduplication, great, then you save it. But if your storage doesn't, so so this QCOW layer will help you in both the ways that if mm -hmm. you are uh, save the base cache and so you can pack more VMs on the same node uh, if they are, as long as they are sharing the same golden image and there is not much copy on write going. And sure. uh, and if the storage is uh, very basic, it doesn't support deduplication, then you save the space on the storage because you don't, you're not creating clones of these uh, base images. So like I, I, from my perspective, uh, because uh, he was asking that, what are the benefits, especially the base cache? Like nowadays, people say the storage is somewhat cheap, but still, I see that uh, people want to maximize that. How do they, how efficiently do they do they make use of this memory? And people want to optimize that and pack as many VMs as possible in the node. So, to, from my perspective, that's why overlay FS was widely successful in the container world, just because it provided the base cache sharing. So uh, something to think about that, uh, do we care about that particular optimization? My feeling is as the images are big and if they are shared significantly, uh, like a uh, community will st probably start caring about it at some point of time. Yeah, yeah that's, I mean, that's, 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 yeah, that's definitely an advantage of, uh, you know, whenever we use container disks, uh, the, the base layers, it's a single copy on the node that is shared amongst all the VMs. So oh, you already, you already do that, right? That's what he said. Yeah, yeah, that we already do that for, uh, con, you know, container disks now are just read only, but like in that persistent ca container disk case, there would be one um, copy of the base image that would be shared by all uh, VMs in the node. Yeah. So this is something like, what exactly is container disk? Sorry, like I don't understand the keyword lingo. So is it something read only disk image or something like that? <clears throat> so it's a disk image that is inside uh, a Docker container. So mm -hmm. it takes advantage of Docker's, um, you know, how it has shared layers and it does its own um, kind of copy on write stuff. So when, um, the image basically when a pod starts uh, a, contain, uh, a VM that has a container disk, um, that container that basically that layer is uh, shared with all that image is shared with all um, VMs on that node. Um, so it's 
it, it take it, it basically takes advantage of like how Docker has you know these read only um, layers. Yeah, Docker yeah. Docker uses overlay FS. So like how like without a queue counter layer, like how can you share the same image between multiple VMs? If they do the writes, will they not trample over each other? So without yeah. QCOW2, yeah, you'd, you'd have to do it down at the storage layer, like the SEP deduplication or something like so that. So they are using a, uh, Michael, so um, I guess the one detail here is when the VM starts, that image appears, but then we create a QCOW2 file that's, um, I believe that's on the like host hoster or host path type of storage um, that uses the shared image as a backing file. So while the VM runs, it can write right. to the disk and it accumulates data into this ephemeral storage. Um, but as soon as the VM is stopped, that storage is cleaned up today. And that's why container disks, when used directly um, as a volume type are ephemeral, if that makes sense. Oh, so it's sort of like a, there is an internal queue count to maze, all the writes go to there, but they are sort of temporary in nature and they will be deleted. So the changes are not persistent, something. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so if the use case becomes evolves more that there is a golden image, which is shared, but we want to keep the changes persistent around and then queue count to layer is more persistent. That's where I think it can help. So, I think yeah. I think it would be really interesting to, you know, if, if somebody did some scale testing and, um, you know, you could, I guess you, you could measure this effect on the page with the page cache sharing today by having a container disk uh, running a bunch of VMs using uh, ephemeral container disks and then um, using CDI to import the, the same exact container disk in a persistent method and then running those VMs. And so you could try, you know, seeing what the overhead on a node is to run, say, you know, 10 of these VMs using the container disk approach and 10 VMs using um, the persistent into a PVC approach. And it would be the mm -hmm. same exact uh, operating system image. Mm -hmm. It'd be an, I think that would be an interesting test to kind of see exactly what kind of benefits we would get on a certain workload. Yep. I agree that. Yeah, I remember we had done similar thing for the container thing also. Jeremy did some nice blogs and chats and showing that how page cache sharing allows you to pack more containers and do some graphs. So I, I guess if somebody is interested in this, it will require similar kind of effort that what are the benefits of sharing the page cache practically. Mm -hmm. Because that was one thing everybody seemed to care about the memory on the node and the OM killer killing, uh, kicking in too often and killing the VMs or containers. So like memory seems to be one resource people seem to care about. Yeah, yep. Yeah, so I would say, I mean, it, it seems like because of that, it's not necessarily a, uh, I mean, it, it doesn't seem like a, a dead idea, but I think it's important to quantify the benefits. There's definitely some additional complexity here, um, you know, in terms of um, managing that extra PVC and having, uh, you know, an, a QCOW2 layer uh, active in a, uh, in a persistent uh, virtual machine, but I think, you know, we'd have to kind of think about all those flows and, and making sure everything's handled. Yep. All right. Um, any other thoughts or comments on the persistent container disks topic? Okay. Um, and on the stuff deduplication, did we cover uh, with that action item? Uh, did we cover that appropriately? Yes, I'm fine with that. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So yeah, I'll try to try to locate that repo. It should be uh, re pretty reasonably easy to do so. All uh, right. Um, so I think the last thing that we have on the agenda. Oh wait, we we should bounce back to the upstream flakes topic. So 
Alex. Yeah. Yep. So if you just click on the CI search, we had this happen a few times. It's uh, what happens is that basically the populator PVC is just uh, not reaching bound. It's uh, actually uh, it gets uh, terminal in claim lost phase, which I believe is a little worrying. I think some something should kick in and start rebinding uh, so that the claim is not lost. But I am not a hundred percent sure. But you can see this happens uh, happened three times already. So I think it's worth a look. Okay. So right. I see it's only happening on the upload populator. Um, honestly, I don't have any idea about uh, why this is happening, but I can take a look. Cool. Uh, is there, do we think there's anything interesting about um, the difference between like this CI and, and somewhere else where it might be getting exacerbated here in this environment? Mm, me personally, I'm not sure. So we have it, yeah, we have upgrade runs, um, NFS storage. I don't know if the exact lanes are uh, matter. Do we run these same tests on uh, a different lane and find them to not be flaky there? Yeah, uh, you can see that it it hasn't happened yet on Ceph, for example. Mm -hmm. So only HPP and NFS for now. But yeah, I expect it to. I don't expect it to be storage related. Okay. Uh, just right. raising the attention because it, it seems uh, as we open more PRs, I believe, uh, just going to keep happening. Okay. Okay. All right. And then let's talk about the second one. And yeah, this is also pretty fresh. Started uh, occurring four days ago. We have these tests where we import a large size QGAR2 file and expect to receive like this uh, error message saying it's too big and no import really happens. But in this case, we get evicted pods, which is something I haven't seen before. And they are evicted because of this pressure. Mm. Yeah. So can you tell us the size? Um so is that the intentionally broken uh, file with like you know six petabytes of, of you know virtual size? So yeah. And, and it essentially should overflow and, and you know we should detect that and reject it as an invalid file. If yeah. it doesn't do that and it tries to import it, then I see why it would run out of disk space because it's trying to write huge amounts of zeros. Uh, yeah, but it just gets evicted. And uh, yeah, it just gets evicted. And I, I had a little lead, just uh, it could maybe be the new NVD kit read ahead filter. Maybe that's reading prior. Uh, yeah, maybe that's doing the reads. The reads shouldn't really happen because we should detect this really early on. But maybe mm -hmm. the filter is kicking in before. No, we uh, we have a, a a thing that runs first that should catch the uh, invalid files before it actually tries to do the import. We have a, a two stages. First stage is sort of the tech stop, and in that stage we should find this. And then okay. in the second stage, we actually import. Okay. But the so first we, stage, if the first stage is not failing, then there's an issue there. So are we not are we not uh, setting up the NBD kit pipeline to run QMU image info? 
No, we do a separate uh, uh, info. Um, so uh, we, we use the, the PR limit, right? So um, the PR limit with the Kimu, Ima, uh, Kimu image info should fail. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. you know, either the memory or the, the disk size is too big. I think we have a few you know, essentially invalid files where there's huge virtual sizes. Um, Okay. Yeah, so yeah, we can scratch that uh, NVD get filter out and just uh, keep looking for some kind of regression because the, the pods are evicted for sure. Due are these to... sorry? sorry? Sorry, are these files, the invalid files created on every uh, CI run or are they a, uh, an artifact that's just existing somewhere? They're an artifact that actually exists in, in the CDI repo. Is it possible that the file got um, changed in a way somehow that it's, um, oh, it should always fail, I would guess, if it was changed instead of just flaking sometimes. Um, so hmm. and anyway, I don't know if there's a super easy, obvious uh, answer that we'll come to on this call. Is there somebody who would want to dig a little deeper into this? Yeah, I'll, I'll keep looking with the lead provided by uh, Alexander. Okay, all right. So let me just add you here. Okay, all right, sounds good. So um, so I just pasted the link to the uh, uh, files. And if I look at the invalid files, they haven't changed in three years, so. Okay. All right. Yeah, I was just wondering if somehow, like maybe they got, um, like if they were once sparse and wherever they're stored, they're, they got populated somehow and, and that was affecting the way that they're being accessed, but I'm not sure. Um, because they, they wouldn't fit in the in the GitHub uh, repo. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it, it's the size that we put in there is, is so large that there, it's insane. So it, it should fail. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So the last thing that we had was to take a peek at uh, HPP issues, which is not a repo that we have looked into on this call uh, as yet. So let's. Start with the oldest one, which is support for read write many. Okay. Um, okay. So it looks like being able to, I, th I think, Alexander, you have a little bit of context on this one. It looks like you were. Yeah, present. essentially, they want to use NFS as a uh, backing storage and then have uh, the host path sort of split that up. It, mm -hmm. it might actually be better for them to just use the NFS CSI driver, which essentially would do the same thing for them. But um, that was the, the idea some time ago where you know, I take a NFS volume and put HPP on top of that. And then I can split up the NFS volume using HPP. Mm -hmm. um, or you know any other read write many volume. Uh, okay, but essentially it, all it, it would is is uh, you know passing a flag saying allow read write many file um, access mode, and you know, I would just generate read write many volumes on that particular source class. So mm -hmm. work wise, it's not huge. I just haven't gotten around to it. Um, yeah. I, I thought with HPP CSI, you can use um, like PVCs from another storage class. Yes. Right? Yes. So that you can't just inherit the um, permissions from the. Right. I, I not... don't. I, 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 that's one of the ways I could, you know, enable it automatically uh, if I wanted to. I, I haven't thought too much about exactly how to do it. it it's, it's sort of weird doing it with HPP. Uh, mm -hmm. But in certain cases, it, it might make sense to do this. 
Yeah, that seems Michael's idea seems like a really viable approach where if the claim, uh, the persistent volume claim template in the HPP CR uh, is it or specifies a read write many PVC, then the volumes we create could have that access mode. Right, exactly. Okay. Okay, so uh, really but, uh, it's not a hundred percent guarantee because if it's a block read write many that I get passed in, uh, and I'm putting a file system on there, then I cannot make read write many. Uh, so there's there's some uh, edge cases there. So when you yeah, I think read write many file or something would be the requirement. But yeah. uh, okay, so what in the terms of uh, this visitation of the issue, uh, is there something we want to add here? Um, well, they haven't. Well, anything has happened in a year, so uh, mm -hmm. I just haven't gotten around to investigating this more. So I, mm -hmm. I, I don't I, know. Uh, I mean, I think I think one way that we could address, like, I don't think we need to be necessarily, uh, you know, I think this being an open source community, if somebody wants this feature, they're welcome to work on it, and we right. could be receptive. So we could. I think that maybe even just providing some advice on an approach. Well, if if you're using NFS, it might actually be better just to use the uh, the Kubernetes NFS CSI driver, which yeah, do the same thing here. So okay, that's so maybe fair. we can put that in there, saying hey, it might make sense to use the NFS CSI driver instead of host path provisioning for this particular setup. I think we should close this and it can be reopened if needed. Does that sound okay? Yeah. This, you know, like I said, the, the, the NFSC side driver would be better for that particular use case. And I, I can think of other use cases where it might make sense, but it's definitely more niche than this particular one. Yeah. Honestly, uh, once we get QSD, I, I think that would be better for the niche case as well. So, mm -hmm. okay, so we have uh, extend VM disk size. I think this one actually got resolved. Uh, Okay. Um, okay. It seems that the person was, uh, yeah, we had a question, okay, from Alvaro from four hours ago. So since we asked the question about closing it, let's give the reporter some time to respond. And maybe if we come around uh, within two weeks or whatever, Alvaro, I would say, feel free to close no, this it, after. It's stay, it's stale at this point, so you know, it, the bot will close it eventually. So, okay, all right, let's go to the last one: removal of this uh, API from Kubernetes one twenty seven, and this is very new. Okay. Okay, so we have a uh, compatibility issue. This looks like a, oh, and we have a pull request uh, to fix it. So great. This is what we like to see. So the uh, conversation can move into the PR and it should be resolved by that. So that's good. Yeah, it should be relatively easy. It's probably that I'm using an older version of the external provisioner that's looking at the uh, CSI storage capacity object. Okay. 
All right, so that brings us to the end of the agenda. We have just a couple of more minutes um, before the scheduled end, so we can do a little open floor if anyone has any additional topics or quick things that they wanted to bring up today. Sounds like there are no additional topics, so I will thank all of you for joining today and for your participation. We'll see you at the next big storage meeting in two weeks from now. Thanks all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.